Uh, my thanks to the conveners and the organizers and to all of you for being here today. And my apologies in advance for not having a great deal to bring to you that's new. I've got nothing like this wonderful research that, that, that tells us what's happening in some areas of the profession that can give us some idea about why we need to be talking about this in the academy and what kind of action might result from our discussions. It's a, it's a wonderful example. You know, you haven't got the code of ethics, write one. And now you get it enacted in some way. Um, all I have to offer you is a little bit of academic theorizing, for which I apologize. Um, the issue of ethics has been mentioned three times by three speakers so far as, as a key element of the formation of a profession, a key element of identity, in some respects an element that can exclude others from the profession, in other respects uh, an ideology that can bring people together. And the notion of ethics just includes many, many different things that I think we have to clarify uh, to some extent. A, a lot of what we've been listening to here uh, concerns work conditions and they're, they're legitimate complaints, they're le legitimate problems, but they would apply to any occupation in that situation. Perhaps the cleaners can make similar complaints, perhaps legitimately as well, okay? Um, and, and we leave them apart to a certain extent. I, I think it's important here in our reflections, uh, if we're focusing on translators and interpreters, to think about what is particular to these professions and not others. And I propose that that particularity has to do with, first, the nature of cross-cultural communication, working on particular kinds of cross-cultural cultural communication, and there are others out there. That's why I asked David about the professions. I mean, language learning is one way of handling these problems. And, and the use of a lingua franca, the use of code switching, as was brought out there. There are other things that can be done. We have to think, well, what's specific about the work of translators and interpreters? The fact it's a third party brought in for a start. And the second thing that I, I, I want to insist on here is the necessity of trust almost by definition, but it doesn't apply to all cases, some party in the communicative interaction cannot control what the intermediary is doing and must trust them and must have some indications, some signal of trustworthiness. And that, I think, is one of the key things we should be looking at. It's, it happens in many other professions as well. The more technical the profession, the more trustworthiness comes in. Uh, so then again, there's no need to just close ourselves off to the wider view of the sociology of professions. I want to focus on the term intervention uh, because it's a very problematic term in relation to trust. Most of the professions we're talking about believe, as has been pointed out, that they are or should be neutral, objective and not intervene. It's, it, it came out here. Although they recognize that it's difficult, the, 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 the normative thrust of the ideology is this is what you should do. You should not intervene. And I think many of you who are doing empirical work have come up with this problem or against this problem. I, I've done in-depth uh, empirical research having lunch today and I, I spoke with Hannah about her recent translation of, of the Arabian Nights into Hebrew, which I find a fascinating project, and I asked, quite naively of course, and did you intervene in the translation? And Hannah will not be embarrassed to admit that she said, no, I don't ever intervene in the text. I take them as they are. And you will get this in the interviews. In France, uh, we were talking about this, uh, that's the first response. That's the response they're supposed to give. That's the official code of ethics. And it's there in the codes of ethics. And then you ask, well, as I asked Hannah, uh, did you improve the text? No. Oh, yes. There were some little connectors and things that I put in. Ah, was that an intervention? Oh, but. Uh, 
And, and then the conversation went on. Uh, and, and we got, well, you know, are there really a thousand and one stories? Said, did you have to select the story? Who selected? The oh, I did a select. You selected the stories. Is that an intervention? And it's not hard to convince most translators that if you get down and discuss what they're really doing, particularly if they're actually editing as well, uh, the degree of intervention is quite great. It's not hard to pick at it, to do, you know, you do cunning questionnaires, as most of us can do, or you get the interview afterwards, as I did over lunch, and, and you can reveal this problematic act of intervention, which can be creative and improve the text and, and, and help people understand each other and all wonderful things, but will contradict the official ideology of neutrality, fidelity, equivalence in some translation theories. What do we here now want to say about that? This is one of the areas in which our discourses, the things we say, can have an influence on the things they say. And I'm aware that they are we. Many of us are practicing professionals as well. So it's not the outside and the inside, but it's the sides of us that are, are, are competing here. The connection, I think, goes from academic discussion such as we have, the profession such as we are, many of us, and training institutions as the big connector. Training as actually forming the, the modes of thought of future professionals. Uh, we are not useless, we can write codes of ethics, but more than that, we can train a lot of the future professionals and thereby do a lot to influence the profession. So we're going to do that, right? Are we going to let people intervene? That's the question. And the more technical question is, can intervention be ethical in some way? And I will answer that question. It's a very easy answer, but because I have to be academic and I have to make up some minutes, I'm going to go through seven bad ways of answering it before I answer it, okay? In doing so, you're going to get a brief update on what, for me, are the contemporary debates in translation studies, which might be interesting, but well. I have an example. Um, the example um, comes from various translations of the long forgotten and forlorn, soon to be unearthed perhaps, Roadmap for Peace. Uh, and I'm drawing on uh, work by my former student, Ahmed Ayad, who looked at the Hebrew and Arabic translations of the American document and of other uh, peace proposals. So it's fascinating linguistic material with lots and lots of interventions on both sides. Uh, as soon as you get into the detail, you can't say one side is bad and the other is bad or good or whatever. Uh, funny things are happening within both languages. Three languages, but English here was the source text, so I can sort of follow what's going on. Here are three examples, and I use it to define what I mean by intervention, okay? Because it, the definition is important for what follows. <clears throat> the roadmap calls for normalization of relations. Uh, obvious translation problem, because normalization of uh, Israel's diplomatic relations with other countries, but also of uh, internal relations uh, within the future uh, solution. What is normal is incredibly different for each reader. And that term normalization has very different content according to the readerships. But the translators just put normalization. They had no need to intervene. It's a term that has to be interpreted, but the translators did not have to interpret it, if you see what I mean. Uh, I'm trying to get around this argument, which I'll meet in a minute, that says we are intervening all the time whether or not we want to do it. Well, no. Here's a translation problem. There are other things that could be done, but the literal rendition doesn't reduce the interpretations. It passes that on to future users of the discourse. It does not constitute intervention on the part of the translator. They do what is most obvious and what is l the least risky for them, 